everybody, and welcome to the Ultimate Job Search and Career Podcast. I'm your host, Bill, the company's expert, but you can call me Mr. Bill Heimer. That's right, Mr. Bill Heimer. And I'm here to answer any question you might have about companies, apparently, like the most pressing, which is if I fax myself, will I go blind? I'm just kidding. We're not here to talk about that. Um, in this episode, we're going to be talking about getting the job. And this is going to be a Q&A episode because I have many, many awesome viewers and listeners. And if you're listening to this right now, you are also officially awesome. Okay. You can tell all your friends. You can tell them that this person they've never heard of says so. And in magical internet land, whatever I say goes. No, I have a lot of amazing viewers who send in questions. And today we're going to take four questions about different aspects of the hiring process. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, let's jump right in. So the first question here is from somebody called Mohammed Amr, AMR. And, and this name is familiar. I think I might've had interaction with this uh, gentleman before. He's obviously got amazing taste. Congratulations, Mohammed. I never knew you had such impeccable taste. That's great. That's a great start. Anyway, Mohammed says, hello, Bill, you are awesome. I really enjoy listening to your podcasts. I followed, I, I followed, let's see if I'm reading this correctly, your advice many times, and it was really helpful. My question is, during the interview, how to mention short-term projects that I worked on as a freelancer or on a contract basis. Thank you so much. Excellent question, Mohammed. Okay. Uh, that's a great question. You know, a lot of people are wondering this in a job interview, you have stuff you want to say, but a common problem is that you are subjected to an interrogation and you never really get a chance to speak freely. You don't get to determine what you want to talk about. You have to answer these direct pointed questions, which are what the interviewer wants to talk about. And they may not be asking the right questions that, uh, in your opinion, would best uh, make a case for yourself as, as to why you are the best candidate. So this is a great question. Now, listen, there are many questions, many standard questions that they ask during job interviews, which are essentially a platform for you to talk about whatever you want. Okay. Now, in Mohammed's case, he wants to talk about the short term projects he's done. Um, or uh, the work that he's done uh, as a freelancer or contract work. Now, uh, here's an easy way to do it, okay? Um, during the course of any job interview, they're going to be asking you one question, which is, what are your strengths? Okay, this question has many forms. Uh, it's usually phrased differently. They could ask you, what are your strengths? Or they could ask, why should we hire you? Or why do you want this job? Basically, they're giving you a platform for you to sell yourself. They're basically saying, give me a reason why I should hire you. Okay. They're going to ask this question in one form or another during your interview. Okay. It's uh, practically guaranteed. I would practically bet you money right now that they will ask you this question in some way, shape or form. And this is what you're waiting for. Okay. Because this is your opportunity to talk about whatever you want to talk about that will make the best case for yourself. Okay. So let's say in Mohammed's case, okay, uh, one of the short-term projects he worked on, um, that he wants to mention, let's first of all, ask ourselves, what did it demonstrate? Why do you want to talk about this, Mohammed? Is it because, uh, it demonstrates your, uh, innovative problem solving skills? Is it because it demonstrates your amazing attention to detail? Is it because it demonstrates your ability to work under pressure and uh, still make deadlines? You know, whatever it is that is the reason why you want to mention this, okay, that's what you're going to say. So when they ask you, what are your strengths or why should we hire you or why do you want this job? You're going to answer with, well, I have, why do I want this job? Well, I have some amazing problem solving abilities that I know you're going to, you guys are going to need in this role, Okay. And, um, then you talk about, for example, this particular short-term project that you want to mention and you describe it in a compact way, usually using the star method, right? S T A R situation, task, action, result. I've talked about that before. And, um, that's how you get that into the conversation. Okay. You wait for them 
to ask the question, which is essentially what are your strengths or why do you want this job or why should we hire you? Okay. You wait for that question and then you have this ready. What does it demonstrate about you? That's what you say. And then to back that up, you then mention this short-term project that you worked on. And that's how you get that into the conversation. Okay. So this general formula, you could apply this to anything you want to say in a job interview, um, any experience that you have, uh, any education you have, or any uh, trait or skill that you have. Okay. Whatever it is that you're wanting to say, if they're, if they're conducting a interrogation of you, which is the way most interviews go, as opposed to having a two-way conversation, which is kind of free flowing and the conversation meanders and goes anywhere it wants. If it's an interrogation style interview, okay, you wait for this question and then you have your answer prepared. Okay. That's how you get that into the conversation. Don't wait till they ask you about it on your resume. Okay. That, uh, usually will not happen. Okay. Um, it's not enough to just have it on your resume and then hope they ask you about it. Okay. You have to bring it up and you bring it up in response to this question, which is the platform for you to make your best case why they should pick you. Okay. Now I've done videos on how to answer that question. I've done videos on, um, a couple of different forms of this question. Um, the most... I believe the most common form of this question is, uh, why should we hire you? Okay. Uh, they will ask that question. And, uh, another popular form of this question is, uh, what are your strengths? Okay. But there are many job interview questions that they ask that they sound different. They sound like they're asking different questions, but really you give the same answer. And the answer you give is points that basically convince them that they should hire you something you have something you've done uh something you know okay so that's how you get anything you want into a job interview that's how you uh that's that's where you place it in the interview and the only thing is uh you've got to do a little bit of preparation beforehand because you can't just blurt out the experience you have to sum up your experience or your trait or your education in the thing that it demonstrates, like the reason why they should care about it. Why should I hire you? Because, you know, I have uh, the skills necessary to make sales to many different types of customers. And then, for example, then you give your story to back that up. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. So thanks to Mohammed Amr. Um, that sounds like a company, AMR, almost like A&M records, right? For people that are old like me that are like, you know, 115 years old. And we remember the days of, of records. Those were the days when children respected their elders. Um, and I know that's not true because I was a child then and uh, I didn't respect my elders. So it's a little hypocritical of me to expect the younger generation to respect me anyway, moving on. So, uh, here we have a question from someone called Paul C Paul C. Okay. Uh, and Paul says, I left out two less relevant jobs to keep my resume to one page. Is that okay? Let's read that again. I left out two less relevant jobs to keep my resume one page. Is that okay? It's a nice short question. Um, yes, Paul, there's nothing wrong with that. Thank you for your question. Um, now, Is it absolutely necessary to keep your resume to one page? I would say no. That's uh, usually not the, uh, it's it's not standard. Usually a two-page resume is standard, okay? Um, Some people can go down to one page and some people can go up to three pages depending on, you know, the specific situation, okay? But generally a two-page resume is standard and you don't have to fill up the second page. You could have like, essentially it's a page and a half. It runs over into the second page. Now, coming back to Paul's actual question here, leaving out less relevant jobs to keep your resume to one page. Is that okay? Yes. It depends like, like, like everything else. It depends on the context. 
Now, if you're going uh, through standard channels, okay, that means that you are applying for a job on the post to job market. So you're responding to a job posting and you're sending in a job application and you're attaching your resume. Uh, the, the general way to approach that situation, the way people get selected is that you essentially have to be an exact match. Okay. As close a match as possible to the job. That's generally the person that gets the interview and uh, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times they're the one that gets selected. Okay. Because this is catering to how recruiters think recruiters. If they're in charge of the job search, which usually they are, if it's a posted job, um, the way they think is that a person has to have prepared their, almost their entire lives for, for this one job. So they have this expectation that people are going to be an exact match. And sometimes that requires leaving out experience that is not an exact match for the job. Okay. So for example, if you have changed careers, let's say you worked for 10 years in customer service and then you decided, you know what? I hate customer service. I'm going to go and uh, work in banking. Okay. But I'm going to work in as like a personal um, uh, financial planner. Okay. Uh, you know, you went to school, you got a degree or something, and then you decided to change careers. Now, if you're applying for a financial planner job, would you include your previous work before your financial training, uh, in customer service? Maybe not. Okay. Um, if the role that you're applying for doesn't really require customer service, then it might make sense to leave it out because the way recruiters think is a uh, principle that a lot of recruiters believe is that if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Okay. And what that means is that if you have uh, not been using skills for a while, then you, you, you forget those skills. This is sometimes true, but a lot of times that is false actually. And so the problem is that if you um, worked as a financial planner and then you maybe did a couple of other jobs for a couple of years there that have nothing to do with financial planning. And then you came back to financial planning. Uh, they may ask you and say, what's this uh, experience here on your resume? It says, you know, you worked in construction or something. And uh, you might start talking about that in the job interview. And the impression that the recruiter would be left with is that, oh, this is mainly a construction type person I'm talking to. And that's not what you want them to think. If you're going for a job as a financial planner, you want them to think that you are a financial planner, right? So you're therefore a good fit for it. So if you have experience that um, doesn't really relate to the job that you're going for, and it may serve as uh, a source of confusion, they might not, not know who you are because uh, the nature of this other work is... Uh, distracting that kind of confuses them as to who you really are. Um, you might want to leave it off. So that's fine. It's fine to leave stuff off. If it's going to harm your case and you're going through a recruiter. Okay. Now there's a couple of things I got to say though. Okay. First of all, this might be a case of, you know, you, you take one step forward and one step back because the problem is if leaving experience off your resume creates a work gap on your resume, that can be an issue. Okay. The only time that usually is an issue is if it's your most recent experience. Okay. So, um, if there's a work gap between your last job and the present, that's going to be a really big deal. Okay. But if you had a work gap on your resume and after that work gap, so like maybe you worked from, I don't know, 2010 to 2013. Okay. And then there's a gap. It, there's, there's uh, your next job is in 2015. Okay. So there's a gap. There's a couple of years with like this unaccounted for in your resume. Um, but then you got a job in 2015 that goes all the way to 2021. Okay. And let's say it's 2021 and you're applying for a job now. Okay. Uh, the, there's a work app on your resume between 2015 and what was it? 2013 and 2015, but you got a job after the work app. In that case, the work app is fine. 99% of the time recruiters won't see it as a problem. 
However, if the work gap is between your last job and now, that will be usually seen as a problem. So in that case, you don't want to leave things off your resume, even if they're perhaps less relevant, because uh, it solves one problem, but it creates another. Okay, I mean, it's really a judgment call. In that case, if you want to do it, it's up to you. But just be aware that you're solving one problem and creating another. Depending on your situation, I don't know which problem would be more severe and which one would be easier, uh, would be less severe. So that's up to you. Okay. The second thing I want to say to Paul C is that um, if you're doing this just to keep your resume to one page, I don't think that's a good enough reason to leave stuff off your resume. In my opinion, um, obviously that could perhaps change depending on your exact situation, but generally, uh, don't try and do anything to keep your resume to one page. A two page resume is perfectly fine. In fact, it's the standard thing. Um, so I wouldn't leave stuff off just to keep it to one page. I would leave stuff off to keep it to two pages. Okay. If you have like a, you know, a, a two and a half page or three page resume, then I would consider leaving some stuff off. And what I would do there, uh, this, this is just me. I don't know how many recruiters think this way, but, uh, you know, when I've been hiring people, um, what you could do is you could provide slightly less detail about some jobs that are less relevant or they're over 10 years ago. Um, but don't eliminate the job itself. Keep it on your resume. Just don't give nearly as much detail. And that should help make your resume more compact. Um, and that should be fine. Okay. So special thanks to Paul C for sending this in. I hope that answered your question. Uh, that's an intelligent question. Um, and if you do get a job through networking or pretty much anything other than applying for a job on the post a job market, uh, your, re your resume really becomes less important. You know, a lot of people really obsess about, you know, how, how should I do my resume? You know, should I use this font? Should I include this accomplishment? You know, people really take that to a high level. And, um, the only time that's semi-important is when you're applying for a posted job. If you're applying for a job through networking, they're really not judging you on your resume. They're judging you on you, your interactions with them. Okay, how professional were you? How much initiative did you have? Uh, how much of a fit do you really seem for, for the role? Do they want to interact with you? These are the things they're going to be judging you on, not your resume, okay? Um, so this is only really important when you're applying for posted jobs. And as we hopefully all know, most people do not get hired by applying for posted jobs. They get hired through networking. That's the number one uh, method that people use to, uh, get hired. And if this is a surprising, this is a surprise to you and you find this surprising, don't take my word for it. Go do your own research. You will find this to be true. So if you have issues with your resume, the answer might not be to obsessively focus on your resume. It might be to look at these alternate methodologies for getting a job. And when I say alternate, I really mean mainstream. Okay. So special thanks to Paul C. Uh, Paul C, I believe, left that comment on a video on my secondary channel, The Company's Expert 2, okay? Uh, I'm sort of funneling all the comments I get from The Company's Expert and The Company's Expert 2. Those are my two YouTube channels. If you are not subscribed to both, I highly recommend that you subscribe to both and uh, check it out. And I'm posting this podcast on both channels, too. I sort of alternate. Uh, between one channel and the other with this particular podcast. Um, but there you go. Now, this is the part of the episode where I would uh, do an advertisement, but of course I don't believe in advertisements, so we're going to move right along. Okay, so the next question here, uh, question number three, is from Moritz Kronje. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. Uh, Kronje? 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 Moritz? I like to say it like that. Moritz sounds uh, a little more glamour and glitz, you know, and you got to have that. You got to have that in life, right? You can't just be Maurice. You got to be Moritz, right? Emphasis on the. Tss. 
Okay, Maurice says, good day, Bill. I'm very grateful for all the informative videos. This specific video helped me a lot in being prepared for the second interview. I just had my second interview this morning, and I was saying goodbye and thanking them for the opportunity. One of the four interviewers walked out behind me, telling me that I did very well in the interview and that the process will speed up very rapidly from this point on. So my question to you is, uh, question to you, what will, oh, sorry, let me go back a second. So my question to you will be, what can I expect now? I don't want to get my hopes up or my hopes all up, get your hopes all up. Although I want to stay positive. My one question at the end was, what will be the next step in your recruitment process from this point on? Okay, so that was from Maurice Cronier. Cronier. Cronji. Um, now, uh, okay, first of all, it's kind of hard for me to tell you what to expect um, in this specific situation. Obviously, however, um, you say you ask them, you know, what will be the next step in the recruitment process, uh, but you don't give what they say, what, what they answered with. <laughs> um now, listen, there's a couple of things here. First of all, um, just so you know, uh, the trend has been for the last 10, 20, 30 years, interviewers, um, how can I put this? They lie. <laughs> they lie. Uh, to be kind, I'm going to say it's manners. It's, it's not wanting to make somebody feel awkward. Okay. So no matter how you did, a lot of times... They will say, oh, you know, it went very well. You can expect that things will really speed up now. Um, okay, so that that could be just a out and out lie. But in a lot of situations, people are, you know, if peace, people are more decent. They're not going to do that. They're going to they're going to mean it genuinely. Okay. Um, but the thing is, uh, in the vast majority of situations, you can expect that no matter how you how well you did, the response is going to be positive. They're going to only respond with positive things because that reduces the level of personal interpersonal awkwardness. Okay. So expect this, expect that no one's really going to be honest to you, to your face in this entire process. And you know, sometimes that uh, continues when we actually get the job, right? As I'm sure a lot of people will agree. Okay. So, um, that's the first thing you need to know. Don't take a lot of what recruiters say and, and other interviewers too, um, at face value. Okay. They're not going to be honest with you one way or another. So just take it for what it is. It, they said something positive. They want to make you feel good. Interpret it as such. Okay. Now you're absolutely right. You don't want to get your hopes all the way up. You don't want to really build this up in your mind so that if it doesn't work out, uh, you know, you get a real shot to the self-confidence you get kicked in the crotch in a symbolic self-confidence kind of way. Um, you don't want that. Okay. Um, so here's the deal. If you went in and it felt good, that's great. Feel positive about it. Okay. But after your job interview, okay. Don't be sitting around, uh, waiting for the phone to, to ring or for, you know, your, the email to arrive that says, you know, we want to talk to you again, move on. The less you can be emotionally invested in any one of these opportunities, the better you will feel in the long run. Okay, that's my advice. Now, I know that's easier said than done. However, here's what you can do. After you do these interviews, even when they seem very encouraging, very positive, it feels like it's going to lead to something great. Forget about that and focus your entire mental energy on the next opportunity. Okay. So apply for more jobs, uh, discover more jobs and keep moving forward. Now, if in the meantime, these guys call you back and say, you know, we thought you were fantastic and we'd like to talk to you more. That's great. That's absolutely awesome. Way to go. Okay. However, it's simply a matter of random chance. Okay. It's a matter of uh, probability theory. Okay. Sometimes they'll call you. Sometimes they won't. There are many factors you have no control over. The biggest one is that a lot of people are idiots and you don't know what they're looking for. A lot of times people are looking for the wrong things. 
Now, trying to win at that game is pretty hard, okay? You could be one of the most talented, you know, people around and you'd still get rejected. And I mean, if you don't believe me on this, look at some of the uh, greatest, uh, most famous achievers throughout history. They've they've been rejected surprisingly, uh, a surprisingly high amount of times, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think everybody knows this, right? You know, it's, it's, it's just potluck. Don't get your hopes way up so that they can be, uh, be dashed to pieces. Okay. Um, and they shouldn't be dashed to pieces because as I said, it's a matter of random chance. However, it's not going to feel like that. It's going to feel like a personal slap in the face. It's going to feel like you're unemployable, and uh, there's something seriously wrong with you and your prospects look bleak. That's how it's going to feel. That's not the reality. Okay. Uh, so the way to succeed at this game is to a realize it's a numbers game and B keep trying to exploit opportunities. You need to discover opportunities. You need to put yourself forward for them. Uh, and the more of these you do, generally speaking, the quicker you'll get hired and the better job you'll get at the end of it. Okay. So it's kind of, um, I mean, I've heard, I've heard this kind of thing said about, uh, actors in Hollywood and elsewhere, you know, they say, uh, like actors, you know, you put yourself forward for, uh, you know, a, a play, uh, a TV show, a movie, and, um, it's kind of potluck whether you get one or not. And, um, if you get one and it, and the play itself or the movie or the TV show bombs, um, you know, you have no real control over that. You're not at the helm. It's mainly the director and the producer and all these other people. And it's on the marketing also. And, uh, you have no control over any of that. So you could be the most amazing actor ever, but you will uh, be in a flop. And it's very discouraging when you're in something that bombs. But what they say is, uh, if you're the actor, what you should do is not dwell on it and instead try and do something else as quickly as possible try and just engage on another project immediately. And that same advice applies here. Okay. Uh, you know, you're going to be rejected a lot of times, no matter who you are. And, uh, it's not going to feel good. And each time it feels like, you know, um, really bad. And, uh, I know that seems ridiculous, but it's true. Depending on your personality type, you could, uh, have a different perspective on this. You could take it really bad. And, um, you know, that's okay. Some people just are like that. I'm a little bit like that. Um, but if that's the case, it's not about changing your feelings. We have no control over our feelings. It's about our actions. What can we do that will result in better feelings? And the thing that you can do is to get back on the horse and immediately focus on the next opportunity. Just assume that everything you go for, uh, every interview is not going to lead to something. Okay. After you've done it, just assume that and focus on the next thing. That way, when you do get a bite and somebody calls you back, it feels really good. Okay. And you're then in a situation where you're going for your second interview or your third interview, or you're going down the process, but you also have other things lined up. You've got other job interviews lined up. You've got uh, other employers that you're in talks with. Okay. Okay. So that also gives you more bargaining power when it comes to things like negotiating salary and, you know, stuff like that. Okay. So there's many reasons why you want to do this. Okay. Focus your effort on the next thing. That's what I'm going to say. And specifically, not to just beat this to death or anything, but specifically, there are many ways to get a job. If you've been really focusing on one way of getting a job, whether that's answering job ads or networking or, you know, some of the other things that I have recommended on my channel, like informational interviews, applying in person, growth opportunities, uh, volunteering, things like this. If you've, if you've done like one or two of those methods, maybe focus on the third one. Okay. A third one. So that's what I'll say. So hopefully that makes sense to Moritz, uh, Kronje. Kronje. I like to say Kronje. Moritz Kronje. Bonjour, that kind of thing. Okay, right. So thank you very much. Moving on, we have one more question. 
And um, if you are still listening to this, you are awesome because uh, as you would expect with any kind of video or podcast, a lot of people listen to the beginning, not that many people listen to the end. So um, if you are here, you are a true fan and don't think I haven't noticed that and I don't appreciate it. Okay, this is from somebody called Fade 110. 110, Fade 110. And Fade 110 says this. Hello, the company's expert. I wanted to thank you for creating this content. Actually, because of your shared knowledge and my skills, I'm getting a lot of job offers. I have to admit, this is a good problem to have. However, I wanted to ask you, and I don't believe you've done this video, but how would you gracefully decline a job offer? My main reasons are, I don't like the salary and the culture and other things of that nature. Your answer would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Bob. Awesome. Okay, so Fade1110 is actually Bob. Uh, the jig is up, Bob. I'm sorry. We've discovered your secret identity, and uh, I have made it public for, for everyone to know, including the KGB. Uh, okay, so how did it gracefully decline a job offer? That's a great question. Um, okay, I'm just stream of consciousness saying this thing here. Um, there's a couple of things here. First of all, in one sense, it may not matter how you <laughs> decline a job offer, right? Because you're not taking the job. However, if you are in a close knit industry or you're in a smaller uh, town or city, you know, where there's only a limited number of players in that particular industry, in that location, uh, you might not want to burn bridges with people because you never know you could be working for these people in five years, right? So, um, that's always a possibility. Okay. So for that reason, you might want to actually handle it professionally and appropriately and do it in such a way that the people who gave you a job offer don't get offended. Okay. They only think positive things about you because that could be useful. You never know. These people offered you a job once there's a good chance they could offer it to you again. They obviously like you. They obviously see value in you. That's not something you want to necessarily throw away. So Bob's question here is extremely relevant. Okay. It's a lot more relevant than a lot of people might think when they first hear it. Okay. So how do we do this? Well, listen, um, there's a couple of principles here. One of them is very similar to what they tell you uh, in how to say no to somebody. Okay. Um, there, I, mean, I don't know where this came from. I don't know where they teach this, but I've heard this. Um, I think it, or it might've originated with all the, uh, Dale Carnegie, uh, books and things, um, from like, I don't know, 80 years ago or something. But, um, a common precept is you have to, if you have to say no to somebody, um, you don't, first of all, you don't say, uh, I, won't do this. Instead, you say, I can't do this. Okay. Um, that takes the, the, um, stigma off you a little bit. Okay. It's not that I don't want to, it's that unfortunately I can't, I am prevented from doing it. Okay. Now in this case, why are you declining the job offer? I'm making an assumption here and that is you're declining the job offer because, um, I guess you said right here, you actually said explicitly, I don't like the salary or the culture. Well, look, let's focus on the salary. Okay. Uh, I'm taking this, uh, I'm declining this job offer because unfortunately, um, I have a better opportunity. I ha I've had a better option. I'm making more money here or this other company has offered me more money. So I'm sorry, I'd like to take it, but I can't, I've got a better offer. Okay. So that can help. Okay. It's not like a conscious decision. No, I'm not going to do it. It's I'm sorry. You know, I, I can't. Okay. That makes people look more favorably upon you. Okay. It also, uh, is easier to rekindle that relationship if it comes up again in the future. Okay. Now the other thing that you want to do here. Okay. Is you got to make sure that you compliment the other party. Okay. Because they have done some amazing stuff for you. They've said, we want you, we think you're great. 
We would love to have you in our organization. We want to work with you. Okay, that's what they're saying by giving you a job offer. Okay, I'm maybe being kind, but a lot of times that's kind of the sentiment that's communicated. Okay, that's the implications. So you want to acknowledge that. You want to say, listen, you know, I really appreciate, you know, the fact that you guys see a lot of value in me and I'd love to work for you guys, you know, and, uh, you know, I, you can, you can then, if you want to really keep this relationship intact, because you might use it later, you could say stuff that you appreciated that they did in the process. You could say, I really thought the way you guys interviewed me was very professional. Um, the way you took the time to do this particular thing, um, you know, I got to know you and you and you, and, uh, that was really interesting. I would love to work with you guys. Okay. So you can say this stuff explicitly and then you say something to the effect of, but unfortunately I have received a better, like a, a offer for more compensation from another firm. And, uh, so unfortunately I can't accept your offer at this time. I hope you understand. Thank you very much. I really hope to work with you guys though in the future. If something does come up, you know, something like that. Okay. That would be a very gracious way of declining it. And, uh, it would, the purpose of doing this, of taking the trouble to do this is to try and make sure that they still think favorably of you. Okay. Because a couple of things can happen. If you do this right, under some circumstances, they could come back to you with an even better counter offer. Okay. And then maybe you will take the job. Now, uh, Bob here says he also doesn't like the culture. So you might not want to accept it, even if they did that, uh, in which case you'd sort of lather, rinse, repeat, and you do it again. Okay. Um, but okay. In the future, you're keeping your options open. And, uh, there may be opportunities for employment at that company, uh, in the future. Okay. Now, the other thing is that remember individuals are not the same thing as an organization. These people might leave this organization, the recruiter, the hiring manager, the people that want to hire you, they might leave and go to other companies in the future. And if that occurs, it would be really nice to have these people remember you and think that you're awesome and want to hire you. Okay. And they also know that you're in high demand. If you've declined a job offer and you've said that it's because I've had a better competing offer that obviously shows that you're in high demand. So having these people out there in the same industry as you possibly working at companies that pay better and have a better culture that can be valuable. So for the five minutes it takes to draft a response to this and the little bit of thinking work you got to put in to craft this response it can lead to great things in the future. And for that reason, I would recommend that you do it. Okay. So hopefully that answers the question. So thank you very much to Bob, AKA fade 110, uh, for sending this in. Bob is just another example of an awesome, upright, outstanding individual who, um, uh, has his act together and, uh, sends in questions to show how awesome he is. So, Thank you very much. If you have a question about uh, the hiring process, about job interviews, resumes, um, protocol, methods for getting a job, um, how you do networking, how you do the other vectors into an organization, including things I don't really talk about very often, like uh, growth opportunities, let me know and I will be happy to take your questions. Just leave a question in the comment section under this video. And that'll be a great start. If I can answer it in the comments, I will. If it's a little more involved and it needs more of an explanation, I will answer it or I'll, I, I could well answer it on the podcast. So thank you very much. You guys are awesome. I hope this was informative. Um, thank you so much for listening and I will see you on the next episode. Take care.